This video will explain about time domain analysis and how to perform transformations from time to frequency domain using fast Fourier transform with the Alter Compose. Uh, time domain and frequency domain are two ways to visualize signals. Time domain analysis gives the behavior of the signal over time, while frequency domain refers to the amplitude versus frequency of each sine wave that the signal is composed of. Time domain analysis considers the amplitude of data over a period of time, for example, uh, displacement, velocity and acceleration to characterize a vibration problem. But these signals contain relevant information and certain kinds of noise that are difficult or even impossible to detect when the, when the analysis is performed only in time domain. Other characteristics and anomalies of the signal are visible in frequency domain, which breaks the signal into its correspondent sine waves. Every waveform can be expressed as the sum of sine waves with different amplitudes, phases and frequencies. And that's why it's necessary to transform the data from time domain into a series of discrete sine waves in the frequency domain. As we can see in this image, the time domain signal on the left is comprised of three different sine waves. The first one with amplitude equals to 1.5 and frequency equals to 20. The second one with these parameters equals to 2 and 50, and the third one equals to 1 and 70. One of the most popular mathematical techniques to achieve it is fast Fourier transform, an algorithm to decompose the signal to represent it in frequency domain. And this image here shows the outcome of FFT function which is the frequency representation of the time domain signal. Now let's talk about fast Fourier transform. Fast Fourier transform is one of the most useful and popular algorithms in signal processing. And the underlying process of FFT is called discrete Fourier transform, which transforms the signal into discrete frequencies based on the length of the data set. Xn is a sequence of complex numbers, and this expression right here could be written uh, with sine and cosine transforms instead. But this form is more cumbersome because it requires two separate transforms. And x of k is another sequence of complex numbers with a frequency representation of the time domain signal. Uh, we can notice that each x of k has n computations and there are n xn to compute, meaning that the total computational complexity is n squared. With FFT algorithm, the computational complexity drastically drops from n squared to n times log n. But how is that achieved? For that, uh, periodicity is key because this term is considered to be periodic and trigonometric relations reduce the complexity of the calculation as many terms will give the same value that was calculated before as we can see here and the FFT algorithm is significantly faster than DFT as the length of the signal grows the following example is how to plot the original signal, its FFT, and each sine wave that it's part of it. First of all, declare the sampling frequency and the length of the signal. Remember that half of the sampling frequency of the signal is the minimum to represent it, which is the Nyquist frequency. The sampling period and the time vector depend on the previous inputs and therefore they may be written as these expressions. Then create three sine waves that will compose the signal. 
the first one has an amplitude of 1.5 and frequency of 20 Hz, like we saw before. The second sine wave has 2 and 50 Hz respectively, whereas the third one has 1 and 70 Hz. Then add these three signals. Create a new figure and plot the time vector in the x axis and the signal in the y axis. And now we are ready to perform the FFT itself. The function FFT gives the frequency domain representation of the input signal and some other arguments may be given, such as the size of the FFT, which is the length of the input vector as default and the dimension on which to operate. If the length of the input vector is not the default, the signal vector is either truncated or extended with zeros to the specified length. And the effect on the frequency spectrum is to insert additional samples symmetrically with respect to the Nyquist frequency. The end frequencies associated with the outputs are spaced in increments of fs over n, where fs is the sampling frequency, and this ratio is the frequency resolution. The FFT result is usually returned as double-sided, ranging from minus the maximum frequency to the maximum frequency. But most real-world applications use only the positive half of the frequency spectrum, which means that it's single-sided. Uh, the spectrum of a real-world signal is symmetrical, and that's why the negative frequency information is redundant. Half the signal at the length of the FFT divided by 2 plus 1 is discarded, which is the Nyquist frequency. Then, let's create the frequency vector based on the Nyquist frequency. Create a new figure and plot the frequency vector in the x-axis and the frequency domain representation in the y-axis, having the signal amplitude as a function of frequency. And in order to create a 3D plot where it's possible to see each sine wave and the composed signal, plot 3 is the most appropriate function. Uh, let's position each curve in a different x-coordinate of the plot area just to give a clear idea of each wave. RepMath function simply creates a vector with the same size of the time vector and repeating the same x-coordinate. When we run the script, three figures are generated and they are stored in the project browser. When we click on the first one, we can see the signal amplitude in time domain. The second figure has the frequency domain outcome from FFT function. And now, clicking on the third figure takes us to the visual frequency decomposition of the original signal. The plot confirms that the frequency representation is comprised mainly by three waves of 20 Hz, 50 Hz, and 70 Hz, respectively, with each corresponding amplitude. The second example will explore what happens when the frequency resolution is modified. So, using the same signal from the previous exercise, we saw that the frequencies associated with the outputs are spaced in increments of fs over n, which is the frequency resolution. In this example, it is equal to 2 Hz. We can confirm it double-clicking on the frequency vector in the variable browser. And what happens if we increase the frequency resolution? Uh, in practical terms, it will decrease the number of frequency bends, leading to a larger frequency difference between each one of these bends. And one way to accomplish it is to decrease the length of the signal while keeping the sampling frequency constant. When we look at the new peaks in the frequency spectrum, we can deduce that one of the signal frequencies is approximately between 48 Hz and 51 Hz, 
because both had a large magnitude. We can have the same conclusion with the third peak, which is approximately between 69 and 71 hertz. Sine waves whose frequencies are not integer multiples of the frequency resolution will experience this kind of leakage. The same situation would happen if we slightly decreased the frequency resolution with an increase of the length of the signal. There is a delicate trade-off between leakage suppression and spectral resolution, either to increase it or to decrease it. Let's see now a third example, which will explore what happens when the sampling frequency is modified. According to the Nyquist theorem, the sampling frequency should be greater than two times the maximum frequency contained in the waveform. In this case, the maximum frequency is 70 Hz, and therefore the sampling frequency should be at least 140 Hz. So, what happens if we decrease the sampling frequency to less than 140 Hz? Let's use 100 Hz then. If we run the script, we see that it's clear that this value is not sufficient to capture each peak of the signal and we see a listen, which is a false representation of the signal spectrum. On the other hand, if the sampling frequency is greater than 140 Hz like it was before, there are more than enough samples to capture the true spectrum of the signal. As we have the fundamentals of fast Fourier transform now, we can move to the next topic, which is inverse fast Fourier transform. So it's possible to get the signal back from frequency domain to time domain using inverse fast Fourier transform. And it's simply a transformation from frequency domain to time domain, which uses the same principle. The underlying process of inverse FFT is inverse DFT. And the algorithm also has the same advantages of FFT over DFT that were previously explained. The DFT formulation is simply rewritten isolating accent terms to use the inverse DFT and one may navigate from one domain to the other according to the problem to be solved. Many signal processing procedures import acquired data in time domain, then transform it to frequency domain, apply filters, and finally get back the filtered data to time domain in order to plot the original signal in overlay with a filtered one. Let's see the following example, how to reuse the previous input signal and the output from FFT to get the variable to time domain. The previous example had a signal formed by three sine waves and its FFT was computed to transform the signal to frequency domain. Now with IFFT, it's possible to get the output from FFT function and simply get the signal back to time domain. IFFT function gives the time domain representation of the input signal and some other arguments may be given, such as the size of FFT and the dimension on which to operate. And the same principles applied to the FFT are also used here regarding the length of the input vector. Using scatter function, we can plot the points of the output from IFFT function using hold-on statement to overlay both curves. The legend follows the order of the curves. And uh, as we run the script, we can see that both the input signal and the output from IFFT function are exactly the same, which is, of course, aligned with the math theory since no modifications like filters were applied to the original dataset. Please visit Alta Forum, a place where users can interact ask questions, exchange information, and post about model-based development.